Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Son of a Blitch podcast. I'm your host, George Blitch. Today, I am joined with a very special guest. Um, you will know him as Professor David Headland or Dr. David Headland. I know him as Coach Dave from our running days back in Boston, but just wanted to let you know a little bit about him. He is a PhD associate professor and chairperson at the Division of Sports Management at St. John's University in New York City. He's earned his PhD and a certificate in measurement and statistics from Florida State University, has more than 20 years of domestic and international experience in sports, esports, coaching, business, education, and analytics. His areas of sports expertise and research include management, marketing, consumer behavior, sponsorships, coaching, esports, and analytics. He's also the director of the Institute of the Interdisciplinary Sports Research, the co-director of the St. John's University Sports Analytics Seminar, and a faculty advisor for esports at St. John's University and an advisor for the Student Sports Management Association. Man, that's a mouthful. And I'm not was, even halfway I was, done. I was going to say. <laughs> there is you, my friend. Yeah, wow. I've 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 traveled a long path since 2000 when you and I first got to know each other at uh, Northeastern. You're you're repping them well today. I know I, we got the uh, the alumni jersey here designed by Alan Lewis and friends. And uh, Alan Lewis was the goalkeeper who you were coaching at Northeastern. And that's how we met. Yeah. Um, so I had just come back from two years as a, a, a teacher in Japan. I'd gone over there because I had some some thoughts about, you know, maybe I could, you know, be a, a professional player in the J League, something like that. Um, some of the guys I played with were able to 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 get tryouts and whatever. I, I never made it beyond kind of a, you know, a, a member of a team where we played against, um, you know, Vissel Kobe's um, youth teams and something like that. I mean, that was about as far as I was able to make it. But later on, I, I did I did was able to progress a little bit. But. Yeah, I came back from a couple of years in Japan and uh, was working with the men's team as a volunteer at Northeastern, the women's team as a paid assistant and mm -hmm. a um, whole bunch of other things, all while uh, having a GA position, um, studying there um, and, and whatnot. So, yeah, we 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 go back 22, almost 23 years now, George. There you go, man. We have we have so many moments what I recall of our times in Boston where like eight o'clock, I'd roll up into your apartment. You'd have coffee ready, and there would be a bowl of chocolate covered espresso beans. And I just remember we would just sit there. It was like our breakfast, and we'd each be working on our own project. And I just remember the drive that you had. Anything that that you went after, you went after a hundred percent with such great focus and tenacity. And it was really cool to have someone that was a counterpart of that as well. Cause at that time um, there's a lot going on. I was getting into the Leonard Peltier event that happened later on that year. So there's a lot of communications I had going with people all around the world, kind of putting together some stuff for that, that, that event at Northeastern. And uh, you know, I think I was working like three jobs at the time and playing with a couple of different bands. So I was busy. So that was time that we, I remember you and I would sit down and just kind of focus for hours on our stuff. Well, like, I, I don't know if we sit down. We probably were oftentimes on the move, but still we That's doing, true. That's you true. know, whatever. I mean, <laughs> you and I both share a, when, when we get squeezed, met, in a metaphorical sense, when we get squeezed by our multiple jobs, our multiple responsibilities, many times that can lead to an increase in our performance. Um, and so sometimes having those pressures added on to us, it makes us perform a little better. But at the same point in time, as you kind of, you know, were, were describing, our bodies need energy. And so whether it's the chocolate covered espresso beans, <laughs> you know, whether it's, you know, your coffee. I actually, when I do a lot of podcasts, I try to, I don't bring my huge like liter jug of, of coffee. I usually just, you know, stick to, stick to my energy drinks, you know, some of these types of things. But yeah, I mean, we were all, I mean, even a lot of the players, you know, uh, as a student athlete, you know, I, I was a student athlete, you were a student athlete, you know, I was coaching student athletes, student athletes, same, same thing. I mean, when you get squeezed by practice, you get squeezed by classes, you get squeezed by trying to have a social life, um, all of these different kinds of things, plus just enjoying the college experience. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you had added 
added things with the Leonard Peltier event and a lot of the groups that you, you were working with. But yeah, I mean, you and I share that, that when we, when we're squeezed, yeah, I think, I think we get, we can get a little bit extra performance out of, out, out of our metaphorical engines. I, I completely agree. And I kind of find myself right now, well, you and I both, we are both married, we have kids. And so we have a different level of responsibility and timelines and different things we have to tend to on a day to day basis. And then all of our workloads. And I know for myself, I feel like I've, uh, especially with this podcast and with a couple of the projects I got going right now, I've put a lot more on my plate. But I feel like my outcome is going to be more because when I put more things on my plate, I, I have I have more creations. I have, you know, everything is kind of firing on all cylinders and I get more done. And so it's kind of just, it, I feel like I'm coming back into that wave after not have being in it like full time. And uh, it, it feels kind of good. So it's kind of funny that like, as we've been, you know, thinking about what we're going to talk about, I just kind of reminded of that time. Like, yeah, we were doing all sorts of things, like so busy. Well, in, in my life, not a lot has changed. I mean, you just, yeah. you know, you just gave a <laughs> like two minute bio. And of course, there's probably, um, you know, another 10 things that I'm doing, whether it's 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 the LLC that my wife and I started, whether it's a lot of the, the, the ways I try to give back, whether it's giving back to the esports community, whether it's giving back to the sports community, I mean, one of the things just it's top of mind because i was i was emailing about it before we got on the podcast um you know at florida state i learned actually i have a pretty good math brain um and so you combine soccer and math together and you get some you know sports slash soccer analytics mm -hmm. um and so i i've i've had the joy over the last um 10 or 15 years of doing a lot of activities in this area and for example right now myself and two of my colleagues at st john's um, we work with a program called the sports analytics club program sacp um, you know those in professional sports probably know it because we work with a lot of the sports analy analysts across professional leagues and the league offices things of this sort we use sports analytics to try to educate uh, high school students, um, especially diverse high school students. You know, the cause could be many things, you know, whether it's the, the, the testing that's been going on over the last 20 years in, in elementary schools and junior high schools and high schools, um, you know, or the fact that, you know, we've never really been able to connect math to real life until recently. You know, with the advent of fantasy sports, now with the um, legalization um, and expansion of gambling, more and more people have an interest in it. But, you know, some, some of our colleagues, they've written, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school math textbooks where all the examples are sports. Instead of car A goes east at 10 miles an hour and one goes west at 15, it's, you know, Messi's making a, a run down the left side you know, at eight um, and Ronaldo's making it on the other side at um, seven. Messi makes a cut inside. Um, actually, I would pro I should probably reverse those. Uh, <laughs> Ronaldo would probably be on the left side. Messi would be on the right. But I mean, using these kind of sport examples, right? Um, you know, Steph Curry's shooting, um, you know, all sorts of different kinds of, of interesting statistics, uh, you know, how many UConn players have been drafted, women's UConn players drafted into the WNBA. I mean, there's so many different kinds of ways in which math can be made more interesting. Too often people see Greek symbols, you know, alphas and betas and things of this sort. And they're just like, I got no clue. But when you actually kind of just break things down and make things simple and, and explain, look, I just want to look at all of the factors that are influencing why this, you know, why Ronaldo or Messi may be, you know, uh, one of the best players in history. Um, and so there are Greek symbols that we use to, 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 to explain this. Um, and so with this SACP program, you know, we work with a, a local high school here in New York. We're also working with a high school out in California um, where we're just trying to introduce math statistics using sports 
And of course, the outcome of this is there are jobs in sports. There are jobs outside of sports, you know, in math, in data science, in statistics, in analytics, um, in, in business predictions and forecasting. I mean, there are so many jobs. This is probably top five, top 10 field for students in, in the near future. So, yeah, I mean, the opportunity to, to, to give back a little bit. But again, I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's a draw on your time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was lucky. I was doing that when I was, you know, um, early to mid 20s at Northeastern, and I'm still doing it now, many years later as a chair and all those other things you described. So, well, it, yeah. and it's, it's fascinating too to see, you know, we've kept, kept in touch and there's been times, you know, where there's been like a gap of a year or two. We don't talk as much, uh, usually on road trips. I can give you a call and I got some free time because we kind of dive into long conversations and catch up. But I've seen the progression of what, where you have gone and, you know, like looking right here. I mean, today, I'm, here is your book that I know you had other people that worked on it too. And there's a lot of teams involved here, but you're one of the top guys with esports right now. You like, if there's anybody that has any questions, you're the one who probably knows all the answers or where to point them to, you know, like you, it, it's, it's been fascinating to see over these last 10, 15 years, the progression of that whole movement of esports and all the business around it. And just the playing side. I mean, there is so many facets to that. So can you talk me into like how you actually first got into this realm of these? Yeah, so, I mean, let me, let me, let me, you know, it's sometimes it's, it's, it's hard for me to take a compliment. I know those who know me, some, some might say that I know few people who are more arrogant than Dr. Hedlund, but at the same point in time, when a lot of this, you know, the first time someone said, I am the most powerful person in esports publishing in the world. Like that was just kind of a little bit like, no, no, no. And then, you know, people were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you wrote the only to this date, um, June 21st, 2022, the only English language textbook on esports. You are the chief founding chief editor of the Journal of Electronic Gaming Esports, um, you know, which is, you know, one of the first publisher supported, you know, dedicated esports journals uh, and electronic gaming. So that's, you know, whether it's haptic technology, the vibrations on your phone, whether it's augmented, virtual, mixed reality, you know, whether it's the health and wellness of our athletes, um, whether it's social issues, whether it's the business, whether it's the, are there ways in which we could have the um, esports in the Olympics, all of these different kinds of things. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled by the compliment. So certainly thank you there, George. I, I, I appreciate that. But yeah, I mean, to, to your question, you know, esports today, I mean, Anyone who is of our general age will say 30s, 40s, 50s. Mm -hmm. You know, we go back to probably Atari's, you know, oh, yeah. in the Pong. early 80s, and then NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System, in the mid to late 80s. Um, probably, depending on what we may have been doing, some of the technology that we may have, have had at our fingertips in the, you know, mid to late 90s with, um, the the muds the multi-user um, dungeons and some of these thing kind of things and then the the um, Warcrafts and the Diablos and some of these kind of games and then you know then we start seeing a lot of the games um, that that are some of which are st are still around today um, you know and so I mean for me I remember playing on Atari I remember playing Frogger and um, you know um, Asteroids games and you know, um, I remember going to University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, where my father was a was a dean um, and going and getting to to play on computers. And, you know, I remember um, baseball games on the Apple two plus to C to E um, that we, we, <laughs> we, we had access to and some of these kind of things. So, right. you know, I mean, I go back to some of the beginning stages of when computer games were um, kind of consumer focused. Yeah, I mean, in 72, there were some of the Stanford events with Space Wars. Um, you know, as we researched some of this, some of the first games, which were tennis-like games, go back into the 1950s. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it was the, the late seventies, early eighties, you know, with the Commodores and the Ataris and, and some of these before we had Microsoft, um, well, you know, windows and some of these where it was just a C sure. prompt and all of these kind of things. So yeah, I mean, I've been, I've been playing games, um, a, a long, long, long time on the esports side. Yeah. I mean, it was probably, um, within the last 20 years or so that we started to be able to, to connect together. And so interestingly, I mean, one of the first first things that people ask about is, you know, what are esports and then are esports a sport, so to speak? And so I, I can actually take these and in, in, in explain both of these. So, you know, we have video games. Video games basically are when we're just playing against the computer. Um, some people might say PVC, player versus computer. Um, you know, you're just kind of playing on the computer against the um you know whatever's behind it whether it's the algorithm or you know the computer programming you're just playing against the computer right these are video games where it gets into esports is where there's a competitive aspect now you could say that of an esports event would be you know when they lined up 20 ataris next to one another and had people playing and then whoever lasted the longest or got the highest score that could be you could you could define that as esports or when using the power of the internet, we're able to log into a game, whether we're right next to each other. Um, so this could be um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or Mortal Kombat, um, whether it's on Nintendo or whether it's on, a, on, on an upright um, video game arcade machine. Um, and you're able to like play with or against one another. That these could be um, some of the founding steps in esports. Um, but probably I think the point where most people would look at is when it's non-geographically bound. So I could be here at my computer, you're at your computer. We can both log into the same game through whatever mechanism, find each other, and then compete with or against one another. That's really where I think esports, today's idea of esports, kind of really gets its 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 fuel. And so, of course, then the question is, well, are esports a sport? So today, um, based on everything we know, um, I would argue that I think most people have accepted that esports are a sport. However, there's one condition that has not really been met in its entirety. Um, and that is in a traditional sports, soccer, baseball, basketball, um, you have gross motor movements. You are running, you are jumping, you are throwing, you are engaged in some sort of body action right when you're playing video games esports a lot of it is fine motor controls eye hand coordination for example so there are people who include in their definition of sports you need gross motor movements now today we have virtual reality technology many people have um oculuses um you know these different kinds of vr headsets sure and so in the same way in which in the 1980s they lined up 20 Ataris side by side today, we could line up, you know, 20 people with VR headsets and have them play the same level of Beat Saber. I think that's a game that many people are probably familiar with in, in, in VR. It's a, you're kind of a, a Jedi Knight with either one or two lightsabers. And then there are blocks that are coming at you with, with arrows. And so you have to cut in the direction of the arrows um, you know, so you're doing all of these kind of things in coordination with you're doing the movements. So, right. you know, you could be listening to Katy Perry or you could be listening to to Lincoln <laughs> Park or some techno music or something. And so, you know, you can you you know, you, you get into this little routine, which you I bet look at as your air drumming. Right. It right. Is, well, yeah, it's the rhythm. Sure, much sure. What you're, what and you're, you're, a, you're a drummer, <laughs> too. So I'm sure you're, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so. You know, you could now have VR competitions. And, and of course, I think VR tennis is, is one area where there is a growing um, VR tennis um, application that can be played. Um, and you can play against one another in VR. So now you have gross motor movements in esports, in video games, where you're competing non geographically bound against people all over the world, perhaps, potentially. Sure, um, sure. And so I think we've gotten to the point now where 
we can pretty confidently say, but certainly, I mean, if you want to be a stickler, you could probably say, yeah, I mean, just playing on a, on a, on a, on a control pad, you know, playing on a keyboard, um, you know, Fortnite or League of Legends or, you know, whatever, Clash of Clans. Yeah, maybe those aren't true sports in the, in the notion of gross motor movements, but everything else about them, the way in which players are connected, you need to be skilled. These are games of skill, not games of chance. You take a, the, one of the best Clash of Clans players and you put them against a, a, a novice, 99 times out of 100, that, that you know, skilled player that expert is going to be able to win, defeat um, that novice player, and so these are these are games of of skill. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's there's so many interesting ways we could we could um, talk about think about esports. But let me just give you some statistics, and maybe this can jump off into some other points. So, cool. Today, um, you know, common estimates are somewhere in the neighborhood of three, three point two, three point three billion people play electronic games video games of one sort or another angry birds words with friends clash of clans counter-strike call of duty league of legends vr tennis so we've got three we'll say three three and a half billion people who are playing these games predominantly obviously it's because we have mobile devices in our pockets sure um but you know there's that's what half the world's population give or take yeah about 600 million give or take are probably playing electronic sports um and so these are where you are playing with or against other people through some sort of connection matching function um through however the games are designed using the the internet and some of these other uh, uh powers that powers that be um and so one of the things that that I think a lot of us have been talking about, at least for the last five years, when I really kind of pivoted and said, you know what, I can do all my management, my marketing, my consumer behavior, my analytics research, but we really, we re there's an opportunity here. And nothing's been more powerful than seeing how many people play. I mean, anyone that I meet, I could talk to them about this. Okay, do you feel comfortable opening your phone? Okay, if not, if you do, if you don't, what kind of apps do you have on your phone? Do you have any gaming apps? Uh, you know, what do you do when you have downtime, when you're sitting in the, if I'm on a plane, uh, you know, sitting in the lobby of the airport? Right. What are you doing on your phone? Are you emailing? Are you being productive? Or are you just kind of, yeah, I mean, I'm playing uh, Wordle. I'm, I'm doing these kind of things. Um, and, and so, you know, most people, in fact, I, I would struggle to think of any person I have met in the last few years who's, been able to say, yep, I don't have a single gaming app of some sort um, that allows me to play on my, at least my mobile device, not to mention consoles and computers and VR and all these other sure. devices that are, that are out there. And so it's a, it's, it's the biggest sports, or I can even say it's the biggest sport without quotation marks, um, where a lot of people just don't even understand some of the basics of it. And so a lot of my purpose in the space is trying to educate. So whether it's writing the textbook, which we did first, whether it's creating the journal now, you know, peer reviewed um, research, um, you know, the the first editorial that I wrote about kind of like the purpose of the journal is that coming out in the next couple of weeks. We've already accepted our first um, health and wellness study, um, which will be coming out probably a week or two after that first editorial as we we space these things out. So the journal is underway. Um, we have a number of really interesting pieces. Um, but right now, I mean, a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the research is health and wellness, the medical aspects, you know, of everything from, you know, whether it's things that we're doing in our homes, you know, with, with stationary bicycles, but we can connect, you know, with the Pelotons and Zwift sure, and sure. all of these kind of technologies, um, you know, to, what we're eating, um, you know, how the phys our physiological responses, uh, overuse injuries, you know, in, in the same way in which, you know, if I sent my goalkeepers out there for three, two a days, so six hours of training a day, how beaten up they would be from the diving and, and, and everything and how exhausted they'd be. Same kind of thing with gaming. Although our bodies can probably handle more gaming 
than traditional sports because it's not as taxing. Wear and we're tear. not doing those gross motor movements. Right, right. But, yeah, I mean, you play games for, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours, which you should not do. But if you're doing that, yeah, I mean, your your fingers, your wrists, you know, your forearms, your elbows, your shoulders, your back, all of these different kinds of things, you know, you're, you're probably going to be a little bit sensitive. And if you do this day after day over time, it's, it's going to be painful. And so even with, with, with my son, my seven-year-old, you know, we, we try to, yeah, you can do a little bit of gaming. Um, you can watch a little bit on YouTube. Um, you know, some of these kind of things you can watch, you know, if you're playing Minecraft, you can watch um, dream and some of the other world's best and learn techniques from them. Or, you know, you're playing Roblox. You can, you can watch any of the number of different people who are, who are out there, who are, who are, who are recording their, their different kinds of gameplay. And so, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of interesting ways in which, um, you know, esports, electronic gaming can be explored and discussed. But I mean, the, the area where I'm most excited is, I don't even know, you know, in many cases, what to call some of these kind of things, the metaverse, you know, a lot, we, we talk about the metaverse in, in very abstract terms for a reason, because we don't really know what it is. Right. You know, Meta Still can forming. invest ten billion dollars, mm -hmm. but what exactly is it going to look like? Is it going to be, you know, something in Fortnite? You know, where when you go in the lobby, you can go to a concert, you can go shopping. You know that there's an Amazon store. Like, what's it, what exactly is it going to look like? And you know, we don't have a lot of answers to those questions. But there's there's a lot of cool things coming in the next six months, year, two years, five years. 10 years, I, I hesitate to even speculate if it's going to be like, you know, the the Google glasses, you know, contacts where we can, you know, we've got like um, Terminator, like readouts of, you know, whatever that we could just say, you know, hey, search for whatever and we'll see it in the, you know, in the corner of our eye or something like that. I mean, there's all sorts of cool stuff that, that that's coming. Yeah, it, you know, it's wild to think about those kinds of things. You know, I remember we grew up, I think, you know, myself, I remember having the Atari Pong and like playing like Oregon Trail and like the development of video games. And now I remember talking to uh, our oldest daughter, Alyssa, when she was saying about how they were watching, I forget the game that, the, that was being played, but they were watching a, a stream, uh, her and one of her friends of the game being played and it was like a big tournament. And then I was like, just, it, it took me a second. I was like, of course this is happening. I've read about this, but now it's like in my home, like where I'm like, wow, this, my daughter's actually watching. Like this is legitimate. And some of the best players in the world are playing. And, you know, I look in this picture behind you and such, and like, there are massive tournaments where it's not just someone going in and seeing, I don't know. I mean, I know Twitch is, is one, you know, place where people will host some of their, there may be video games or, you know, my buddy KJ does drumming on that too. It's a place where people can go and kind of check out whatever it is that they're presenting. But there's, I know there's a lot of other types of streaming services out there, but not only is it that, like there are massive, like worldwide tournaments where people are coming from all over to, to play in these atmospheres. And like, it, I think people that, you know, whether you define a, a, a sport by the gross motor movements or whatever, you, you can't deny that this is a huge phenomenon that is here to stay. And it is a sport. And like, you know, touch on it for a sec, because you were talking about the idea of working towards getting this into being an Olympic sport. So it, it's like, is that something that we actually might see? Do you think? Is that something that's coming out? Like, yeah. So let me, let me backtrack for one second, because you, you hit on something that's really interesting. So um, you know, if I, if I'm self-promotional, I could say, if you look at the front cover of <laughs> my textbook, you'll see that, um, it is a Dota two event on the front cover. And so Dota two, when you look at the, yeah, so it's a Dota two event. When you look at the top gamers who are, are, you know, getting salaries and making money through playing. Mm -hmm. Dota 2 is the number one game out there. So the, the publisher of the game came up with a really creative way for a little over 100 days before their event, which usually happens in, in August or September. They have, you have the ability to buy things in-game with a portion of the proceeds then going to fund the prize pool. Um, now, certainly during the pandemic, it's been 
a little bit more difficult, but I think they've been increasing each year to, you know, within the last year or two, it's been 35 to $40 million prize pool for the winners of Dota 2, wow. where individual winners can walk home, you know, with several million dollars. Now, a couple of years ago, before the pandemic, Booga, who won the first Fortnite World Championship in July of, what, 19? Um, you know, he walked away with $3 million, um, you know, for winning that, for winning that championship. And so there's a, there is a lot of money out there, which then, of course, leads to your question, which is, okay, well, what about the Olympics? So, um, again, I mean, ironically, my colleague um, here at St. John's, Dr. Simon Pack and I, we wrote uh, and published an article um, about um, you know, the uh, esports in the Olympics for the right, parentheses, or wrong reasons. <laughs> um, so we, 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 we examined this issue in a, uh, a more qualitative manner. Some of the arguments sure. kind of for and against it, because this was a policy journal um, in, in which this ended up being published. Now, for the uh, Tokyo Olympics, now they were, they were pushed for a year. Um, but originally for the 2020, there was going to be, I believe it was the Intel Masters. It was going to be a half a million dollars um, for a cut for at least two games. Um, now, it was not going to be part of the Olympics. It was going to be played before the Olympics. With that added year, um, the, uh, um, the Olympics and, and some of their partners, they put together five of them um, in sports. Um, so some, some boating and cycling and, and some of these kind of things. Um, and so they did this before the, uh, so it was what, summer of 2021. So I'd say June of 2021 mm -hmm. uh, is when they held some, again, it's kind of, it's got some Olympic support. These are not like metal yeah. events though. There's some associations there, but it's not it, like an yeah, officially sanctioned. I think this sanctioned. is sponsors of the Olympics. Right. Um, so there's, there, there's a, there's a marketing piece to this sure. leveraging one sure. affiliation, but of course. I don't want to bore people with, with marketing talk unless, <laughs> unless I'm being specifically asked about it. Um, but at the same point in time, yeah, the, 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 the Paris Olympics, which are upcoming and then the LA Olympics. And so, you know, in France in, in, for the Paris Olympics, yes, there have been some discussions, but there are some inherent challenges that, that Pack and Hedlund discuss. For example, most Olympics are announced, you know, at least six or seven years in advance. So, Today, there is, you know, uh, the game Among Us, for example, I'll take kind of a, a little bit more newer game that's only been around for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, when you were describing your daughter watching a tournament, Fortnite. Among Us is one that now I think that I, a lot yeah. of a lot of um, <laughs> high schoolers play and, and enjoy. And even my son, my seven year old plays a Roblox version of the, the, the game as well. Um, and so I think a lot of a lot of people like like to play this game. And so, yeah, I mean, could you um say today in 2022 that in 2028 among us which is a privately published game of four, by a for-profit company that's trying to make money off the game will that game still be in existence in 2028 sure. can you guarantee me that the game will be there yeah it's possible will it still be popular sure um, yeah is this so, a relevant I mean, thing there's right. there's logistical issues um, you know, not to say the least of which is, you know, just by the Olympics own charter. I mean, you need to have a like an international governing body. And in fact, in esports, there are multiple ones, whether it is the um, International Esports Federation, IESF, with their, you know, 110, 120 nations, which have IESF um, national governing bodies, um, whether it's the World Esports Federation, um, you know, with with their relationships. Um, you know, whether it's Wesco, I mean, there, there's a number of international groups that are out there that are all kind of positioned, but there is no one group. There is no FIFA that oversees soccer equivalent in esports. There are multiple groups that are out there. Not to say, not to mention something I, I just kind of touched on briefly, which is most of these games are owned by a private company. Right. So these have to be licensed. I mean, there are intellectual property concerns. Does Absolutely. The, do the Olympics want to support a private company or do they, you know, what kind of financial arrangement would they need to have with a publisher in order to offer 
Call of Duty, your Counter-Strike, or League of Legends, games which have been around for a while and based on their development are likely to continue to be around for, for a while. Um, you know, what kind of relationship would need to be made there? Does the IOC want to support um, these private publishers? Um, because then we get into um, lobbying and some of these kind of things. What if, you know, um, there are groups that own large stakes? Um, in fact, some of the international groups are, are funded by private um, individuals who may be, you know, funding them because they hope to get their games into the Olympics and then they make money because of it. Sure, so, sure. I mean, there's, there's, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist here, but I, again, I just want to kind of lay out, there are lots of interesting considerations when it comes to this. The, the only games that would really work would be games that the IOC develops. And by last count, a lot of these really popular games it costs in the neighborhood of $100 million to bring a brand new game to market. I don't think the um, IOC is going to be spending $100 million to develop a new game that may or may not be a hit or a success. Sure, sure. So, yeah, I mean, will we see it? Yes, we've already seen it. We've already seen regional competitions, which have got which have licensed the intellectual property of certain games that are popular in those regions. And then they hold competitions um, and they give medals, um, you know, to champions. Uh, you know, we see the Overwatch League and the Call of Duty League, these these international esports leagues around these games where there are teams around the world that are that are competing. Um, you know, whether, you know, the Overwatch League, when they had them, you know, kind of all in California that first year. And then now they're they're kind of all all out there on their own or these world championships. Um, these tournament providers, um, you know, ESL, ESL One, and DreamHack, and and some of these other organizations that are that are organizing tournaments uh, all over the world. Yeah, I mean, it's there's a lot of activities, but when will we see this in the Olympics? I mean, I could imagine maybe in LA. There's a lot of game publishers out in California, out in the oh, LA yeah. region. I'm sure they would love to have some of their games. But again, there are some IOC rules and whatnot that kind of need to be followed and adhered to if you're going to do this. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we'll we'll wait and we'll we'll see in the next few years. We'll we'll certainly figure this out. But yeah, I mean, whether it's at the Olympics, whether it's some a pre-Olympic right. non-metal event, yeah, I mean, we're going to continue to see more and more of these. But yeah, when we see you know League of Legends. Um, you know, over multiple weekends, you know, with with streaming numbers in the, you know, tens, if not hundreds of millions, um, you know, depending on how we want to count, you know, if it's every time someone logs in, someone logs out, whether it's unique viewers, you know, that's, you know, even just how do we measure some of these things in esports is right. an issue that we face. This is where my analytics side and my esports side kind of merge together a, a little bit, but yeah, I mean, there's there's more questions than answers right now, but it's it's really exciting to be in the space and just just talk to people and try to try to educate, um, you know, as much as I can. So let's get to that, too, because you've gone and you've been invited to speak at many different symposiums, gatherings um, in, you know, I, I know you're kind of at the forefront of a lot of these things, too. So I'm sure that each aspect maybe one they might be asking you about marketing or maybe they might ask you about this little niche of it so like are you actively are they having you come out and and speak at a lot of things now that kind of the world's opening back up and you know were you doing i i can only imagine you're doing a lot of zoom you know conferencing for the last couple of years and such too but <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure I mean, you're a pro at that <laughs> we we you know we we joke we joked when you asked me if do, I, do you have a high quality mic um you know <laughs> I yes ask. i had to ask uh, i know, you know the answer I not not every not every, not everyone does, uh, <laughs> but you would, right? <laughs> excuse me. But you know, at the same point, yeah. I mean, before everything got started, yeah, having the opportunity to go to 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 to, to China, um, to to South Korea, you know, this year, you know, I'm if if I can swing it, I'm going to be heading over to Sweden um, later this year. Um, we're hosting a research conference out in Hawaii beginning of next year. Um, yeah, I mean, 
again, I mean, it's 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 a little bit challenging sometimes because some nations have a little bit more fewer more restrictions than 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 others, and so it's it's always a little bit hard. But yeah, I've I've spent much of the last uh, two to three years on Zoom and and other conference platforms, you know, talking to you know whether it's even some local people. Um, you know, a, a high school where I could be on St. John's Queens campus and throw a ball onto the into the yard of a school. Um, so walking across the, the, the street to, to Thomas A. Addison High School, you know, or be talking to, you know, um, co- collegiate leaders, um, you know, in the state of New York or high school leaders in the state of New York to around the nation to um to other countries um to other places to other groups um yeah i mean i i do my best to you know while not driving myself crazy um you know give back and and educate and and help talk people through the biggest area i probably speak about most is literally just the the organization of esports which probably to your viewers would be fairly mundane and boring but literally if you just kind of think about it you know, you and I both played high school sports. Can we offer esports in high schools, you know, after school activities? And of course, we know that today there are multiple providers of esports at the high school level, you know, whether it's some um, NASEF, whether it's some um, Play Versus. There's a number of these types of organizations in the United States that organize uh, high school level esports. But how do you want to do this? Um, you know, because you have to get the you know intellectual property um, licensing of any of these games that you're going to um, use. And ironically, some publishers, um, you know, you absolutely must have a license in order to organize a competition. In for other publishers, they're they're much more hands off. Look, if you got more people playing our game. You know that's really what we're more interested in. We're more interested so in as many events as you aspect. want, sure, right? Whatever you can do to to organ, you know, find more people who are interested in playing whatever our game may be, and so even within the the publishing space, um, you know, it's a it's a really interesting kind of um, variance just in terms of of uh, of what types of publishers out there, and then of course, you know, you can have clubs that are. Do you want to play video games? Do you want to build video games? Do you want to do the development side? Sure. Um, and in fact, that's the route that St. John's um, has taken. We certainly have the competitive side. You know, our main Discord channel, we've got over 800 students um, and alumni who are, all, who are all there. We've got several other, um, you know, we've got a, a Big East eSports. Um, we've got more of a, a club eSports as well. Um, so there, there's a lot of things we're doing there, but our academic programs are more on the video game design. So whether it's an English major writing a, a script, what's the storyline of the game? You know, is this a shooter game? Is this an adventure game? Is this a sports game? Um, you know, what what's the narrative of the game? Um, you know, what would someone speak as a narrator to the game? You have now landed on... Planet S O B, son of a blitch, um, you know whatever. The son of a blitch's planets. Knew they'd find you know, it. No, you are going to be playing <laughs> drums, you know, in order to move on to the second room, you know, whatever. Right, right, right. Um, so whether it's the you know writing that, whether it's the actual like computer science and 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 building aspects, whether it's the art and the animation aspects. Yeah, the interdisciplinary connections there yeah sure, how are sure. we going to make you know the business aspects how are we going to make money out of this um you know how are we going to you know try to encourage people who play this game to when we produce another game then switch over to this um and so there's there's a very interdisciplinary multidisciplinary view of a lot of these things and so more and more educational institutions from elementary schools on up are, are looking at these there's curriculum where you know we can teach students how to code using minecraft using roblox um you know there are companies that produce um you know um unity or unreal engine which are two of the most popular um engines used to power video games how do we build these games using these 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 great tools and so there are coding 101 
Um, you know, my son, um, obviously, because I have a little bit of a background, he gets an iPad from his school and there are coding games. And I've taught him how to, you know, write the programming um, to do some of this coding. So these are really simple. They're almost Frogger. Some of them are Frogger like. Sure, you know, sure. You, there's a there's a, you know, 10 by 10 with yep. 10, you know, 100 little spots and you got to, you know, there's a diagonal. And so you got to program it to, OK, um, move, move yourself down one over one down one over one and then okay well how would you automate this so you know rerun down one over one 10 times so right. how would you program this so you know my son has learned this and i think maybe sometimes he he probably knows more about coding than his teacher does but he's got this ipad that's got all these cool tools on it and you know he's able to to, to, to learn some of these kinds of things and um and so yeah i mean there's so many interesting future outcomes, whether it's education, whether it's relaxation, you know, whether it's socialization, um, you know, whether it's, it's, it's career preparation. There's so many different aspects to gaming, to gaming within uh, schools, within academic programs, within extramural programs outside, whether you're playing, competing, organizing tournaments, le learning all of these kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the skills that students need can be found within many of these different aspects. And and so more and more people, are, I think, are in recognition of this. But still, there's a lot of people who are uneducated about these. There's still a lot of stereotypes about of gamers and gaming nerds and, yep. and that it's only this certain, you know, dark subsect of the population that's, that's doing this um, and that these people are x y and z and many of those stereotypes just do are either patently false incorrect misunderstandings or otherwise and so again as i kind of described earlier a lot of my what i look at my role is educating people and so if it's a local school if it's a state group if it's others yeah i mean i'm 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 trying to do my part and you know if i educate enough people then yeah, I mean, and they hear these messages, they hear these lessons, you know, they will then be able to share some of these things, they'll do their own explanations, they'll, they'll take what I've taught them, but they'll also learn new things, and then they will educate, and then pretty soon we'll, in the same way in which we have an army of marketing professors teaching marketing at universities, you know, in 15 or 20 years, we will have an army of electronic gaming, video game, video game design, video game development, business of video games, um, uh, you know, esports competitions, event management in, in esports, you know, uh, uh, esports management. We'll have all of these kind of faculty members, professors, teachers at all levels with a better understanding than, 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 than where we are today. And so it's really exciting. And, and I kind of love being at the forefront of this because I do get to see a lot of things that a lot of people have only dreamed of. Yeah. And so it, it's really exciting. It's really thrilling to kind of be in this innovation, emerging technology space, because what I knew yesterday, tomorrow may be wrong um, because of, of research or, or, or development to innovation. So yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, play a small role in this because one person can't do all of this themselves. It takes, it takes an army, whether it's writing the book, you know, whether it's doing the journal. Um, yeah, the 47 people involved in the book, the 54 people who are involved in the journal, you know, the, the hundreds of people involved in any of the number of groups that 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 are that are working on these issues. So, yeah, it's 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 an exciting, exciting time to kind of be involved in a lot of this. It totally sounds it. I mean, I think about like the idea of the legitimacy of the careers that you were just kind of touching base on, you know, the having that in this, this collegiate level and all the different kind of courses and things you can study, but the business, the, the marketing, the analytics, the statistics, there's so many different things in the development. I mean, I got a kiddo too, that's, you know, doing some computer programming. As I drive home from work every day, you see all the signs. It's like, you know, coding camp, coding camp for this age, that age, where when we were first growing up, computers I mean, we did some programming i mean i remember like building all my old websites and like html now you just drag a picture and it's like oh it's there i'm like Dreamweaver. Oh, that would have taken me 
20 hours. And then of course the client would be like, I need all these things changed. <laughs> yep, and now you just got yeah. WordPress. Yep. Exactly. It's so the, the interesting thing. So I'll, I'll, you know, I try to be neutral. I try not to throw out too many names sometimes though. It's impossible to, to avoid it. So in this case, it's probably impossible, but hit marker. So hit marker is a website jobs in gaming and esports. Okay. They did a study. I want to say it was 2000 to 2001. Uh, or 99 to 2000, it was it was one of their recent ones. And so year over year, it was an 80% growth. I think they went from just over 5,000 jobs to just, uh, you know, like 9,000, 9,500 jobs, year over year from one year to the next. And so now granted, a lot of these are the technical, they are the computer science, they are the, the back end, the stack engineers, the programmers, you know, that's certainly the biggest area where a lot of these jobs are. But as I tell all, you know, I'm the chair of a sport management division at, at St. John's. So, I, you know, the second and third areas are probably all like sales and, and customer sponsor relations. You know, um, it, you know, where you're working with, you know, trying to motivate customers to attend, consume, watch sponsors to sponsor, to to invest money. You know, some of these some of these business types of, of functions, these, you know, community, you know, they, they've all got community like community specialist kinds of titles because, yeah, we're building community around our game, around our team, around our sport, around our league, you know, around these kind of things. And so, yeah, I mean, there's more and more jobs three years ago, if you were involved in your colleges esports club team that alone could have gotten you a job in an esports company today yeah you're probably going to need a lot more but again they're going to be looking for more specialized types of skills um you know it's one reason why for for you know i mean i i have a pretty large community on linkedin good community of of people i'm connected with and i mean i am constantly seeing you know, the CFO from professional sports league in the United States takes job as, you know, the, the, the CFO of, you know, any sports team, um, you know, or the market research director of a traditional company that's looking at, at news and media becomes the head of esports research at an, an online market research company, you know, all of these different kinds of things, you know, people moving from you know, people moving to 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 to, to Microsoft to work on on, on Minecraft education, um, you know, people moving, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, with just putting together a podcast and then they get a job at Twitch. So if this whole pod SOB podcast doesn't work out. You may be able to parlay this into becoming an, an influencer and a streamer, which may that actually be, a be Twitch your, your subtle goal. There you go. There's a, so, there's a nice you know, ring to that. Yeah, there's there, there's so <laughs> many opportunities now out there for jobs but still i mean the the biggest driver of a lot of this is if you were to you know if we were to go to our kids classes and ask that what do you want to be when you grow up there are going to be more and more people who are talking about i want to be an influencer and so influencers yeah i mean you've got um kardashian influencers who you know are using a lot of the traditional media but you know through television now they've gone a little bit more to the the social media and and online streaming and and, and some of these types of things with with hulu and and other groups um but you have lots of people whether it's on twitch whether it's on youtube you know whether it's on some of these um other you know facebook gaming you know some of these other kinds of platforms i mean those are probably facebook youtube and, and facebook they're um twitch YouTube and Facebook, they're probably some of the biggest ones, although, you know, parent company of some of these, uh, you know, there's some overlap between them. Right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of interesting opportunities out there and more and more young people, you know, they're probably thinking, yeah, I'd, I'd like to, you know, create my own videos. When you have five-year-olds, now six-year-olds, who, and, and not mine, but others, who are world's best in, you know, Call of Duty, you know, something, something like this. Um, and with a couple of Google searches, you could probably find out exactly who I'm referring to. When you've got five-year-olds who are some of the best, when you've got 90-year-olds who are some of the best Grand Theft Auto players, 
um, out there. When you when you've got you know retirees who are are some of the best race car drivers. When you have non abled bodied individuals, um, you know the 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 um, you know people with different physical um, uh, um, challenges that they they face, but yet they get adaptive controllers. Um, and so, you know, the quad gods, you know, are, are, are one that, that, that I think of um, here in the United States. In fact, one of the United States' best, um, you know, like, um, uh, I don't know if it's Tekken uh, or Mortal Kombat, um, is, is a non-able bodied individuals. I mean, and this is where gaming gets super interesting because, yeah. you know, we talk about in sports, everyone can play. Just the other day, I saw that, that the, 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 whoever's in charge of, of international swimming is, you know, in terms of transgender athletes, that they put some, some limitations. Um, you can't have transfer, uh, um, uh, what was like age of 12, I think, um, you know, your, your, your gender identity. I mean, you know, and so there were, you know, there are all of these kind of things where there, there are limitations and barriers and, and, and challenges. That, that, that people face, but in gaming, everyone can play. Even, you know, just because today we may not, you know, someone who, you know, maybe they only have use of their eyes. We may not have an adaptive controller that works with like um, yeah. eyes, but right. it could be developed. Oh, and I'm sure it will be, yeah. I mean, I, I often quote Toni Morrison when, when people ask me about why did I do what I did? Um, and in fact, some of the inspiration comes from Tony, Tony Morrison, a famous um, African American writer and speaker in the, I, I think 1981, I want to say she was speaking to the Ohio Arts Council. And she talked about, you know, if you want to read a book on a topic and the book doesn't exist, write it. Yep. And so that kind of philosophy, that entrepreneurial, innovative, something doesn't exist, build it. Um, you know, I often, my son loves Legos. I often think about, do I have the knowledge to build a Lego sorter, you know, where we could sort all these different, by color, by parts, you know, the number of times, you know, I have to build and rebuild and get the instructions out, all the Legos that, that get smashed and broken and all of these different kinds of things. And, you know, the vacuum the cleaner. that my wife and I go through with this. <laughs> what can I build to do this? Can I build a machine that'll be like, it'll sweep up all these pieces and it'll tell you, in this pile, you have these three sets. Let me separate them for you. And then here's a bag. Here's everything you need to rebuild the car and, you know, the Minecraft set and, and all of these different kinds of things. And unfortunately, I don't have the technological understanding to do some of that. But I know there are people who are building Lego sorters and, and, and things like this. And so, sure, yeah, I mean, you know, there's opportunities out there, I think, to to build and, and innovate and, and, and create and of course, that kind of brings my life almost full circle because that was really what my PhD dissertation was all about. The creation of value within sport organizations and the fact that, you know, when when people, uh, you know, were thinking about sport organizations for a long time, you know, they basically thought of everyone as in the way business does, that you are individual consumers, which negates the fact that how often do people go to sporting events alone? And the answer to that question is rarely, if ever, you go with others. So that means you can't think of sport consumers like business consumers. You know, the, with the way in which um, Stop and Shop or CVS or, you know, Amazon thinks of their consumers, you know, as individuals. You can't think about that when you're thinking about sports consumers. You have to think about that in a much broader way, this group, this community of consumers. And so how do you create value amongst, within, through, in partnership with groups? And so, yeah, there's, there's, there's so many areas. So I'll, I'll let you choose where we go next with the conversation. Well, you know, I was thinking about like, you know, there's certain, like, you're never going to make a living playing video games. I mean, you, you, that sentence has Not been true. said by many parents over, over time. And now you're talking about, you know, you're just mentioning some of the prize pools there of, you know, millions of dollars and how many tens of millions of dollars may be behind one particular event. And you're talking about collegiate teams. Um, and it, I, instead of assuming the answer, I'll ask, are there college esports athletes who are getting 
um, they're, they're getting their colleges paid. They have scholarships. scholarships. Yes. So absolutely. we're, you're seeing like the, so you can, you know, be able to do that. Now you can answer your parents, children, if you're listening. Um, here we go. You know, you coach David Headland told me, um, and it's, it's amazing to, to see that. And I really saw that first bit of it when Alyssa was playing Fortnite, that was the, the game. And she was talking about the, all the different players that were, you know, super big at the time. And I, I think you even hit skins. on one of them. And In Fortnite would be the skins, right, which was, did, did you want to buy which, you know, Wonder Woman skin or, or, uh, you know, a Dune skin or a Star Wars skin. And I can't remember which, because she walked us through that a little bit and our youngest was there. And like, we, we definitely were kind of learning because she's playing us. What, what is this all about? I was very, very like interested because I came with a gaming background. I used to play a lot of games too. And um, even, you know, you know, back 10 years ago, friends would come over and every now and we'd throw out the old FIFA, the super soccer from the old super Nintendo. And we played these games that were kind of sports related mainly. Cause I, I, that was kind of what I played the most of at, at the time, but I'm watching this and looking at the graphics and I'm like, I, I realize I'm, you know, I'm, I don't feel like I'm the old man in the corner, eh, these kids, but I'm looking at the graphics and the interaction and the quickness of it, like the displays it video games have come a long way because we you know we were the first ones i actually we uh we, we watched um was the movie the wizard have you seen the wizard mm. red savage oh my gosh you gotta go play it with your kiddo so basically fred savage has a younger brother who turns out to be a boy genius on video games and they go because they're gonna go play at the super nintendo tournament where they, I think just to date it, I think it was like Super Mario 3 or something that was coming out. But I remember actually going to these stores back in the day where they would sell the video games. And I remember playing in a tournament and they had Tetris. And I remember winning my store. So then you'd play against the other stores in the region. And I think I like won one or two. And the, then they gave us a whole new game, Dr. Mario, which was like, it had just come out. No one had ever seen it. And you know, I, I forgot what I placed. I didn't make it to the next round, but it was all these tournaments to go to the Nintendo finals or whatever they called it, you know, like Nintendo power championships, whatever it was in the day. But I remember like that was the first time I ever saw um, some iteration of that kind of competitive gaming actually on a paying scale, whatever it was, $25,000 was probably the prize at the time or something to that effect, you know, it's like, but now all the levels of sponsorships, all these tournaments, all these intercollegiate like groupings. And I, I am fascinated by it because even as you're, you're talking now, I'm like, you know, new things are coming in that, oh yeah, that does make sense. Oh, oh wow. That's a whole potential too of the marketing. Oh yeah. There's going to be college professors. There's going to be people taking these courses in colleges that are going to advance them in whatever it is the business or maybe if it's in the player side the developer side and i and i'm just fascinated by that so i guess you know when 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 i at the beginning of this long-winded little rant the idea was like this the kids are able to get scholarships now like how explain to me this like how does a kid who's sitting there playing and he feels like he's pretty good he's playing with all his friends like yeah man you really got what it takes are, how are you as a player then showing this college that you're worthy of a scholarship to get into their university? It, the In one sentence, the same thing that a traditional student athlete would do, an esports athlete would do. Send the tapes? Send, well, in this case, <laughs> just send an email with a link to your Twitch page. Yeah, yeah. Where you're, where you're, you know, where your performance is recorded, you know, be a top 100 player in the world. Um, you know, and, and let a coach know you're interested in, you know, attending their university. And yeah, that's, it's, it's, it's the same, it's the same thing as a traditional student athlete. Um, you know, some people call them athletes. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, they, you know, if they're playing a sports, then they are student athletes. So I, yeah. I don't, I don't really see the, see the reason to, 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 to change from that. Plus with the changes to name, image, and likeness, you know, this, the NCAA actually had the opportunity several years ago to involve itself in esports, and they indefinitely tabled those votes and and discussions. Um, and now they'd received some some detailed reports about how it would work and whatever else, 
but they just didn't want to deal with it because of course in many um esports competitions there were prize pools and so in fact uh, yeah. a lot of the uh, publishers and organizers they found really creative ways i'm going to set this up as a trust fund and i'm going to give you access you know if you win you get access to the trust fund that way you know you get the money that the university can't can't do it right but in the beginning i mean some of these top athletes they were having to create legal like contracts with their with their schools of you know i'm going to compete i'm going to wear your merch um but i'm gonna compete and i get to keep all the money um but you're gonna pay for my school you know what you know literally like you need a lawyer to to review the contract sure you know, some of some of these kind of things so certainly the last year has been different because a lot of those name image and likeness you can you can leverage them um and and there are ways in which uh if you're competing you can you can get paid so to speak um you know for some of these kind of things but esports athletes have been doing this for several for several years now does every university have esports scholarships absolutely not right. in fact the gross majority do not um most of the universities i would say that have by last count i mean they talked about there were probably a hundred maybe 200 schools universities that had esports scholarships a lot of these were academic scholarships that kind of got repurposed repackaged okay. um, cut up into chunks for hey you're an esports you're good at esports so we'll give you a couple of you know a couple of thousand dollars you know some something like that there are some universities that yep you are you are a student athlete playing esports and esports is housed in our athletics department um, and so everything that a student athlete gets in the athletics department, you get. So whether this is tutoring, whether this is notes about missing classes, um, you know, generally that's not going to be an issue because you can, you can usually kind of stay in your home facility and play from there. Um, unless you're playing in, in like, um, you know, we sent our super smash brothers team to the, um, collegiate esports commissioner championships um back at the uh what second or third week in may um down in atlanta um and so they placed fifth in the nation um in super smash brothers but the top two teams um central florida and bay state college each of them had, had bay state i think had two top 100 in the world players and ucf had one top 100 player um and so of course playing against those type of players yeah for a someone who's played a lot expert but yeah going up against one of the world's best yeah challenging to 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 say the least so there may be some competitive disadvantages with 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 some of this but yeah right now there are esports scholarships out there but you mentioned parents i spend a lot of time talking to parents um there's <laughs> a lot imagine. of parent groups who 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 you know you know come and they you know, you know is it good if my little Janie or little Jimmy's playing eight to 12 hours a day? No. Um, if I was in the weight room for my soccer, preparing for soccer for eight to 12 hours, my coach is eventually going to kick me out probably after like three hours. And so parents need to do some of that. However, there are other activities that they can do. In fact, I encourage a lot of them, you know, use Twitch, use YouTube to watch replays. Every day, my son asks me at some point in time or another, Daddy, do you know how to make a totem of undying in Minecraft? No, Jaden, I, I have no idea what the recipe is to make a totem of undying. I just know if you go to a woodland mansion and you kill these certain creatures, they will drop a totem of undying. <laughs> oh, well, I learned from this YouTube influencer streamer, here's how you make a totem of undying. So, ha ha ha, I know more than you about Minecraft. <laughs> And so, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, in the same way in which we did scouting, um, now, at, you know, I mean, we would watch video of other teams. We'd watch video, you know, later on, we would get video of teams we were playing. We'd cut up the video and we could give our, our strikers, you know, um, video on the defense that they were going to be going up against. And so, you know, you can see that they're not really good at holding their flat back four. So there are opportunities for you, especially if you, you know, for playing two in the front, you know, going to the left side, going to the right side, um, because this, their, their left back is just a little bit lazy and doesn't always 
get into that line. And so you may be able to take advantage and do this diagonal run, staying on side, but getting behind their, their two center backs, um, which gives you a nice run in on the goal. And so, you know, we'd be able to, to um, you know, create videos for, you know, cut up videos. We'd be able to, you know, um, here's video of a player, you know, with goalkeepers, you know, if we encounter any PKs, sure. here's the last five PKs that they're, their their player who predominantly takes these will will take and and so you can see four of them are going to the same side and so you know here's their run up so they're doing a little bit of a stutter step and whatever illegal or illegal based on you know soccer rules you know here's what they're doing here's where they like to place it and so you have the ability now because many of the best players they they've got video you know if you were in a um fortnite competition against ninja you know, who for many years is, you know, still really highly respected in, in Fortnite. There are thousands, tens of thousands, I, I don't even know, of hours of his play. And so you could just watch some of his play in order to get some sense as to how does he play. Um, but again, I mean, I, you know, if I don't stream any of my stuff, but a lot of the best players, they do because they can monetize this and they can make a lot of a lot of money, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars um, a month. If they're if they're if they've got their own skins in the game, then you know they sell those and they get you know whatever, you know five, ten, fifteen, whatever their commission rate is. And so, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of interesting ways in which you don't have to just play the game. You can spectate, you can watch, you can scout, you can learn other strategies. You know, there are. Um, you know, Clash of Clans is another game that I play on my mobile device. There are, you know, um, uh, lots of things. Um, the um, Go Wipe or Go Wee P. So that's Golems, G O W E Wizards, W I P P E, Pekas, Pekas, depending on how you want to say it. So this is the Golem Wizard Pekka Pika strategy. And so you send in the golems first, then you send in the pekkas, and then you just have this ring of wizards that just absolutely cleans up behind it. And so, you know, there's all of this lexicon for different strategies, different techniques, different tactics that you could use when you're playing these different kinds of games. And so, you know, you can you can learn some of these. When you get into some of the games like Overwatch and League of Legends, where you have I did the calculation of League of Legends. Something like five, there are five billion combinations of like the the heroes that you could play in the game. Now, obviously, you know, it's much more limiting, you know, because there are certain players that are just better. They have certain skills that you want, you know, mm -hmm. okay, this player, they're using this champion, then you're gonna need to do another champion. Um, you know, in order to, to, you know, to kind of, you know, if you're, if you're a jungler and you're in the middle doing some of these kind of things, but there are all sorts of strategies and tactics where you could do this literally as you would do a homework assignment. Okay, son, I want you to watch five of Ninja's best, go on YouTube and search for Ninja's best Fortnite or Twitch or whatever. Um, and I want you to, you know, watch his stream and I want you to report back on what weapons is he using? Um, what areas is he going to? Now, again, with patches and all sorts of things, games change. I mean, that's the bane of every player's existence is the game two years ago is not what it was now. Clash of Clans, they now have this, this um, you can use this balloon to, to go up into this capital peak with all these new things, and they're always evolving. In the beginning, we didn't have dark troops. We had like four, four troops that we would use um, way back in the beginning. And of course, now there's, you know, 30 troops that we can use. Um, and so there, you know, in each one, depending on if you're in, you know, in your builder base, in your main base, in Capital Peak, how you play, you know, you're always evolving how you play. But that gives you the opportunity to always keep learning. Find the best players, learn how they play, you know, watch them, take notes. This then becomes a task in information literacy, which in normal people speak is research. You know, so if if your daughter is still playing Fortnite, you know, um, you know, have her research some of the players, you know, have her then report back on some of these things in the same way in which my parents probably said, yeah, you, you need to go and learn how people do this, this quantitative modeling um, that I'll tell my son, hey, you need to go on and you need to figure out which weapons are people using um, if you're in in Roblox, if you're playing 
you know, pilfering pirates, or if you're playing, um, you know, Harbor Havoc, or, or, or whatever games he's playing. I, I, fr I frankly can't keep up with it some days. You know, what are people, what are people doing in these games? What are the tr strategies and tactics? You know that they're doing do you in pilfering pirates do you stay up on your ship and fire your cannon and, and whatever do you get down into a boat and try to board other boats you know um you know which weapons are are, are people using are they using the rubber ball or the bombs or you know all of these different kinds of things there's a lot of things that you can learn and of course you can literally just sit back perhaps then you're probably just worried about eye strain and and some of these kind of things, blue blue light, and and some of these other concerns that that, that people may have, um, but again, I mean, there there are ways in which okay, so for every hour you do this, you got to go and you know spend some time walking around. You know, I'm going to teach you how to do yoga. We're going to do meditation. You know, you got to figure out how you do some of these other kinds of things. Um, you know, a lot of the research that I read is is topics like this. You know what what can we do in order to to help people be healthier with their gaming gaming activities and, and behavior so you know there's 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 so many ways in which even as parents you know we can we can we can help our kids to to create good habits um, when it comes to how do they game some of these different kinds of things um you know i mean i break my rules all the all the time i mean as a chair i spend a lot of my time in front of this computer writing emails and, and doing some of these things, but you know, you catch me at the right time. I'll have my, um, you know, my, my, my gaming gloves, you know, that, uh, that I'll, uh, I'll pop on here to, you know, and, and, and in fact, I, I, I wear a lot, I wear these, you know, even when I'm just, just writing emails because they, they, they compress my, they compress my wrists. They compress my, my fingers. You can see that I've got some holes there. If I, you know, holes in the fingers and, and whatnot because they you know they're they're put on and taken off but yeah i mean some of my some of my colleagues so what do you what are you doing over there dave you weightlifting or whatever no these are my these are my you know gaming com compression gloves that you know they can you know make sure that i'm you know using good form when i'm sending emails and some of these things and they've got little um rubber on them as well so i get i get i get good traction and and some of these kind of things and so you know, certainly a lot of my fingers, especially my my shooting finger, they're they're all worn down, and so you know whatever else. But yeah, I mean, there's there's all sorts of really uh, interesting opportunities for parents to be involved in reading and learning and and, and all these kind of things, and and then suggesting to their kids and um, you know ways in which you can incorporate some of this into the same way in which we might quiz my son on his spelling and his math and some of these kind of things. You know, it just means that we've got to learn. Okay, so um, we might have to do some of that research on our own. So instead of, you know, reading, you know, e news about, um, you know, whatever's going on in the world of entertainment, where we're self streaming, you know, these these influencers to learn, and then we can turn it on our kids. So, son, do you know how to make an invisibility potion? You know, with these kind of things. You know, do you know, you know. Um, do you know that by pressing F5 in Minecraft, you can get uh, different views of your game? You're not just looking through your eyes. You can see like a, a camera, like 10 feet in front of you in the game. So you then have the ability to look at yourself as you're doing all sorts of different kinds of things. You know, I mean, do you know these things? Um, and so, you, you, you know, you can really engage your kids. That's, I think, one of the one of the most interesting opportunities is a lot of parents are you know, I'd say probably it's a little bit of the older generation because they didn't grow up with games. But, you know, right. our generation, we grew up with Nintendo. And so absolutely. Yeah. When we're playing Super Mario Brothers, are we are we Mario? Are we Luigi? Are we the princess? Um, who's the fourth one? Who am I missing? Um, it's not a game I play a lot. So, you know, yeah, but, there, there's a host of characters you could be. Sure. Sure. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think about Mortal Kombat. I mean, who would you want to be in that? You know, I mean, a lot of people, you know, they like to be the um, uh, the ice guy because they'd like to freeze their opponents. Um, you know, um, the, the twins because they could tear people's heads off. And, you know, um, who's the one who throws the chain? You know, come oh, here. Yeah. Oh, some yeah. Of kind of, some, some of these kind of things. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we're probably a little bit more active. But, yeah, like keeping up with our kids' games, whether it's, you know, League of Legends, Overwatch, Fortnite, Among Us. You know, mobile games, if it's League of Legends Rift, uh, 
you know, what, whatever else, if it's, you know, um, you know, the sports games, um, you know, some of these different kinds of things. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it just literally takes sitting down with our kids. What, what, what are you playing? You know, instead of how was your day at school? What, what are you playing? What, 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 what games are, or what, what games you're playing? You know, what coding games are you doing on your computer? Um, okay. You, you had an hour time to play Roblox. What games did you play? You know, and then, and then learning about some of these kind of things. My, you know, my wife sees my son's playing a game where you're, you know, killing people and, oh, I don't like that. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's okay. You know, the research suggests this is, you know, the, uh, on the causality, this is not going to cause him to want to go out there and, and commit murder. Um, might it make him a little bit excited and aggressive when he loses and, you know, <laughs> darn it. Yeah. You know, some, some, some of these kind of things. Yeah, sure. You know, same thing. When when I get killed unexpectedly, yeah, I'll probably be saying the same things. I'll just be like, well, it's happened a million times already. So, yeah, but, you know, it, it happened. Uh, you know, I can't Take believe I... Take your gloves off and <laughs> throw them across the room. Yeah, sure. You know, that, <laughs> that, t- that type of thing. Um, you know, but... Yeah, I mean, I think parents can be really engaged with their kids with a lot, with a lot of the gaming. So, sure. Well, it's important too. I mean, just monitoring what's going on. You know, you talk about like Roblox, and you know, our youngest when she's been on it, and there's times I'm like, okay, what's this chat box up in the corner? Oh, well, other players who are playing can you know chat about strategies, whatever. And it's like, okay, well, that opens up a, you know a different level of you know monitoring that we need to do as parents. Okay, can we shut down this feature or whatever it is? I think. I think a lot of parents, they're afraid of their kids going off and kind of going in their own rabbit hole and finding, you know, whatever it is, because there's, you know, there's dark corners anywhere in life, right? But in the gaming world, and when you can have interactability with other people who are complete strangers, you know, there's things that maybe, you know, the, the idea of like YouTube kids, or there's something that's marketed there for these kids and you know oh you can't be a certain age to play this but there's always you know like again there's dark corners everywhere right so it, there's there's a huge importance in in being able to monitor or sell, set those restrictions on things too and you know playing with your kid if there's a new game or things too that you know a lot of folks do i think you know when there's certain avenues and games and i you know i don't i maybe not everyone knows roblox but there's a series of games you can play within this uh within this division there's a series you, of games well, thousands <laughs> world, worlds of games right exactly well i mean you, you, yeah it's amazing like what what's there but you you can kind of play anything and you can play you know first person role you can play team stuff there's all these things that you probably want to sit down with your kids and and see what they are exploring um there's times where we found there was some um there's some like really aggressive violence and language in this one particular, you know, a uh, game that she was playing within Roblox. And we're like, whoa, okay, that one, that's, that's, that's a little too quick. And, you know, it's like for a lot of people who listen to the news every single day, you might be hearing things on the news, especially the first five to 10 minutes that are going to be, in my opinion, potentially more damaging than a lot of other things you can find because we know it's the doom destruction, you know, that all, all the, you know, things that happen in, in, in a day to day that are um, very glorified, the violence and whatnot. And that's like what people are, are, you know, here's the next thing that's horrible that happened in your city today. Ah, you know, you're you, like, I make sure that that's never going to be played when my kids are around, because I feel like, you know, I mean, things that have happened where, you know, I mean, think we can even bring it into this idea of like what, you know, recently with the school shootings here in Texas, like I didn't want to have that playing um, in the background and talk to my kid about that in the last few days of school. And like, yeah, so it's, it, that's it, like, it, oh man, it's, 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 it's filtering, interesting, right? You, you call me coach Dave. And so, you know, when you are at, in a traditional sport learning to be a coach, you know, there's um, like, the first lessons you always learn as a traditional sport coach is like child wellness, sexual harassment, um, you know, a lot, a lot of these different kinds of basic issues, nothing to do with like the X's and O's of coaching, right. all about like the wellness of athletes and, and, and some of these different kinds of things. When there are esports coaching certificates that are out there that are available that people can take. I believe in almost every one that I've seen, lesson one is safety on the internet. And so even with my seven-year-old, I mean, I, 
um, just the other day. I mean, I always kind of, you know, broach the topic carefully, but, you know, okay, so your friend, you know, is, uh, you know, this is, this is, this is your friend, you know that, but how do you really know that it's your friend who's at the computer, you know, playing, you know, what if it's his mom or his dad, you know, what if it's someone I, I use the c- completely facetious, but what if someone breaks into his house to play Roblox on his account? Yeah. You know, something like that. You yes. don't know who these people are in most situations. And so we have to be very careful about who these people are because we, you know, even though it's someone we might think we know, I mean, last night I got a friend request from my mom on Facebook. But I'm already friends with my mom on Facebook. So, you know, I got that and pretty immediately reported it as someone, you know, trying to be my mom. Now, I don't know why they'd want to be my mom, but, um, you know, they were, you know, that was that was happening. And so, you know, you're 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 starting to teach your kids as you're supposed to do, I think, as a parent, you know, about many of the dangers of, of, of the world. And and this is a this is a legitimate one when we when we hear those stories about someone, you know, um, was convinced to share explicit photos and then were threatened to be exposed and then, you know, commit suicide. You know, some of these, I mean, that's sure. terrible. I mean, that's, that's awful. That's, you know, um, like a school shooting that's, that's going on. I mean, these are, these are stories that we want to shield our kids from, but at the same point in time, you know, we, we, we do need to educate them about some of these types of issues. So we can, we may be able to shield them from some of the, some of the terrible aspects of it. But at the same point in time, we can we can educate them about activities and behaviors that they can they can utilize to make sure that they're that they're safe. Right. Um, and so, you know, in the beginning, you know, uh, and, and, and still, I mean, sometimes I think, you know, even with with Roblox, I should be paying a little bit more attention to what my son is playing because he but I can I can he plays on my account so I can I can then see every game he plays. Right, right, right. You know, but he doesn't know yet how to type on the keyboard. So right now he's he's safe until he develops that skill. Once he learns how to type on the keyboard, um, then you know, then it will then it will have to explore other kinds of things. You know, when he gets a cell phone, we'll have to explore, you know, some of these different kinds of things. But yeah, I mean, I think as as a parent, as a you know, with kids who play, yeah, I mean, understanding these kind of concerns you know being able to talk to your kids about these kind of issues i think these are these are really important for parents to be able to do and and so yeah certainly in any e- esports and, and related topics yeah it's really important it is man and you know it's knowing when to kind of have those you're talking about like you know those protective barriers you have and sometimes they're going to be temporary you're not going to tell your kids everything about a certain topic you know and you have to kind of like you said it's a delicate thing too to be able to to bridge those conversations um you know with everything in life too but you know it's the online gaming the this it the emergence of something that um we didn't have the same we weren't growing up with it at this level and now um i think you know certain people who didn't they might look at this and it's it's their hands off. They don't know how to even conceive it. I can conceive it. You can conceive it. We grew up gaming. We like we played video games and it wasn't. I mean, I think that it's kind of opposite too. I, I'm I have a feeling that this was probably similar to you too, having so many sports backgrounds. But you know, I remember it was the street lights come on. You had thirty minutes to get home. My parents didn't know where I was half the time. We might have been at so and so's house or so and so's or at the park. Usually, you could drive by and if you see a big clump of bicycles, like that's where we were. That was like our social media was <laughs> who was playing where and going where. But that now, of course, with you know every kid at a certain age is going to have some type of device, some type of eye watch type thing or phone that they're going to be carrying with them. Where there's always this communication, and they also have this ability to always have the world at their fingertips and it's it's challenging as a parent and i know that you've done way more research into this kind of thing you've you know you've probably tackled this on on a whole another intricate level than i have but you know it's uh and and my wife being an educator too it's like we've talked about a lot of the things too that you have to prepare for and um as many as like 
folks out there who are worried about that world, I see what you're talking about is there's so much also excitement. There are so many potentials of like being able to take this to the next level. You can build your own games. You can become a master. You could have a career at this where, you know, it's like as a musician growing up, it's like, everyone's like, eh, so what'd you do for your day job? You know, it's because, you know, as a musician, there's not many that make it to this, you know, huge high paying thing. But now there's more levels in the music industry you can work in. And now it's like you're seeing, you know, somebody that's like playing video games that like, yeah, they actually can make a, a living and they could become a millionaire doing that if they're one of the top in the world and they could get sponsorships on top of this. They can totally have their whole career through that. And it's it's wild to think about that because that I, I don't think that was ever a possibility that we imagined when we were a kid and maybe your brain is a little bit different. Maybe you saw that because I know that you've kind of always kind of had a head for this kind of space here, but I'm just fascinated by it, man. And I'm, I'm just super excited that you came on to talk about it today. And um, I definitely want to chat, you know, as, as you have the journal comes out, you know, more your next books that you have a big events that you're going to speak about. I'd love for you to come back and report to us about those and, and kind of keep us in touch. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be happy in a couple of years to bore people with, here's what we've learned about esports research. Hey, you know, we're gonna, last, we might have a couple of years. We're going to have maybe a, a certain amount of viewers that are going to be doing that, that are interested in that. But I, <laughs> that 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 viewership is growing more and more. But it's it's fascinating. I know, your, I know your wife will. I mean, she, yeah. when she was doing her PhD study, some, some of the work that I was doing was really interesting to her because she was like, yeah, I'm learning about this in class. So, yep. yeah. Um, it's fascinating, man. It's fascinating. Well, right, well thank, thanks for having me on today, George. Thank you so much, man. It's great to see you. And uh, once again, um, tell people where they can find you, read about uh, your projects and such. Uh, DavidHeadland.com is probably the best place. Um, if we know one another or if you're interested in learning more about some of this, I, I send people to LinkedIn because, again, professional, nice professional place to, to have professional resources and, and whatnot. So, yep. Sounds good, man. Well, thanks once again. We'll talk soon, buddy. All right. Take care. Bye, George. Take care.